Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon. It is October 4th. Don't go looking for class the end of September. That last week we did skip. So two weeks apart from our last class, we will start verse by verse, word by word in uh, verse 5 of Bereshit, Genesis chapter 27. I'll go back and review from verse 1 on, but a uh, couple of little things real quickly first. A couple of weeks back, we talked about the Philistines and the Palestinians. I brought out how they are not related, that the Palestinians of today are not the descendants of the Philistines of the past. I tried to bring thousands of years to two different areas of history in a quick little synopsis, and I didn't manage. I had it in a couple pages long. It's actually about three pages long. So if you want something that long that summarizes what I was trying to teach you, um, maybe make it a little more clear, let me know. I can send it out an email to those of you in my Zoom room, and I have copies for those live today who want it. And if you need something in snail mail, just tell me. But once again, um, all the evidence from archaeology, DNA, science, uh, history, everything, they're two totally separate groups of people. The Philistines disappeared. Um, they they uh, morphed, what's the word? They took on the people that they were, they assimilated. And the Palestinians of today are the misnomer. They are pulling up a name that was a region rather than a people. But without get, opening the door too much to talk more about that now, just ask for the paper, okay? Secondly, I don't know if it got on the last of Zoom class. Uh, I mean, the last class when we were Zooming and, and live, uh, but the question was raised about us being judged for every idle word that we say. I gave a quick answer, but I wasn't satisfied with the answer I gave you because I know this concerns a lot of people. A lot of believers do not realize what judgment comes for them after this time here on this earth. So in a short, without it taking the whole class, let me just uh, say to you, and for those who don't know the background, let me give you... Uh, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37, this is what raised the question. I don't remember how we got on it, but because it's the Word of God and because it troubles people, I think it's important to look at it and answer Matthew, it. 12, Matthew 12, verses 36 and 37, which I will read for you now. Um, Yeshua, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, to uh, those around him who are seeking to be... Uh, they're putting themselves up that they are righteous and right with God, yet Yeshua called them out. He called them whitewashed sepulchers. <clears throat> they look good on the outside, but they're dirty dead bones on the inside because they were not right with the Lord. They were not, uh, their heart wasn't right with God. In verse 36, Yeshua said, But I tell you that every careless word the people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So people have latched onto that, and, and even believers I know who are very concerned that they're going to be held accountable for comments they make, things that they, that they say and do. Now, I don't want to give anyone a right to throw all care to the wind and say, oh, now I don't have to worry about that, because if you're really trying to please the Lord, then you want to have your words right also. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you show by your words. That's one way that you are justified or condemned because it's showing what's in your heart. But let me back judged, up. Right? You'll be let, me, let me talk about the judging. Let okay. me back it up and say, these words that show the disposition of the heart, they show the true character. They show the index of the heart. When somebody comes out with something rapidly and quickly, it's usually the heart that is speaking. They haven't had time to think and, and maybe you know channel it in a better way. So really that language is showing what the spirit of the man is like. Someone once said the heart is a fountain and the words are streams that come out of that fountain. We, we all get the idea. Now again, Yeshua was calling out those around him who were wicked. They were not right before God. They were not in right standing with God. Um, they had even just claimed that he was doing his miracles by the power of Satan. That's how far off the track that they were. They were threatened by him, and they, they were coming against him. 
And he was responding to all of that, saying that you will be judged for these words. You'll be held accountable for saying that my power is from Satan rather than from God. Now, why would they be held accountable? Because if they don't come to saving faith in Yeshua, then they're going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. Now, as soon as people hear that word white in there, because we know white standing for purity, they jump and they think that that puts Christians there. Christians never stand. And by Christian, I mean a believer in the Lord Jesus for forgiveness of sin, to be their savior, to have died in their stead, paid their penalty for sin, the salvation in Jesus and he alone. When you have that saving faith, you will never stand at the great white throne judgment for judgment. Okay, that's all the sinners through all the time from Adam's generation to the last generation, past the tribulation, past the thousand years millennial reign, Satan's the last big hurrah to try to take people uh, to, to dethrone God and put himself up as God. That gets put down, and then right on the heels of that is great white throne. All the unsaved will come and stand before God in that judgment that day. That's such a horrendous day of judgment. The earth flees, the heavens flee at the Lord setting up his throne in the heavens to bring everyone up, to open the books to judge. The first book that is open is the book of life. In that, they will not find their names. They're not worthy of life because they've never received the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So they will now stand before God and be judged for what they said, what they did, how they acted. And we even see um, from Matthew chapter 10, and since we're close there at 12, go back to chapter 10 with me. Whoops. I went the wrong way. <laughs> no, Matthew. We're saying Matthew for a moment. Matthew 10 and 15 shows us that apparently there's even different degrees of punishment in the future. Because it says in verse 15 true, of chapter 10 of Matthew, Truly I say to you, it'd be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for the city that's rejecting Yeshua Jesus that's seeing him. What the Lord was saying was those who actually are seeing him and seeing him do these miracles and not believing judgment is going to be worse for them than those who didn't have the living example right in front of them but still had you know were were disobedient to the truth did not receive jesus so we see that that and the way i put it is someone like a hitler needs to suffer a greater depth of suffering in some way for eternity than a sweet little old lady who didn't hurt a flea but sadly did not love the Lord and receive the Lord but obviously they, they don't deserve the same eternal torment they, it's got to be different in some way but that's the judgment for the unsaved again I stress that the believer does have a judgment also it comes much earlier that judgment's called the Bema Seat of Christ, is how we put it in our English, and I'll give you that reference. There it is, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. The judgment seat, or the Bema Seat of Christ. The Bema was the altar, uh, not the altar, what do you call this? The podium, maybe they do call it the altar. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Um, when you were to be in a service, you know, everything comes to that altar today in the synagogue, it's where the rabbi stands, it's when the scrolls are read, they're placed on it, and they're read, the scriptures. Okay, so we're coming to the, the, the main focal, like the altar of heaven, so to speak, but I don't want you to think altar is sacrifice. But we're coming to, to God's throne room. Now, you're already in heaven when you stand at the judgment seat. That's what I'm trying to get across, is that it's in heaven. How do you get into heaven? Got to be born again. Right, got to be born again. Got to come through the shed blood. You're not in heaven and then get saved. You don't get in heaven without being saved. So obviously you're not standing there to be judged whether you're saved or not. If you're standing there, you're already in heaven. You know you're saved. It's That decision was made before you left this earth. Now, And, and I believe this takes place during the tribulation period. 
because one of the things that we get rewarded with is Yeshua Jesus' robe of righteousness. That's what we come back wearing at the end of the tribulation when we come back and battle with the Lord in the battle, the end of the battle of Armageddon, Revelation 19, leading into the millennium. So if we're wearing our robe of righteousness, we've obviously stood before him and received our rewards. So that puts judgment seat during the tribulation period. I guess the Lord's going to be able to do it in seven years, <laughs> which now tells you where I stand on the rapture, and that's fine too, but not to get sidetracked on that. So we as believers come before the Lord for reward or loss of reward, not for salvation or lack thereof. We come before so that, that when our works, everything that we've done, when the fire comes to it in some sort of symbolic way and fires, you know, showing what burns up is wood, hay, and stubble. What lasts is gold, precious stones, you know, this sort of thing. So when the Lord in some way puts fire to our works that we've done, well, we did ourselves, we might have even thought, well, I'm really doing the Lord a favor. I've done something real good here, but we did it in our own power. That'll burn up. But what we did by the power of the Holy Spirit on us, in us, and through us, what we did for the Lord as we worked during the time that we were saved down here, we will be rewarded for it. We know there's different rewards mentioned. I'm not going to go into all of them, but if you lead someone to the Lord, there's a reward. If you're looking for his coming, there's a reward. There's all kinds of rewards. We get crowns. We get to give those crowns back to him. But 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 15, tell us about your, our, our works being tried up, being tried by fire for reward or loss of reward. I'm going to read just the end. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15. And I'm going to read probably just 15, but I might back up and read it all when I look at it. 1 Corinthians 3. I'll read it real quick. I just don't want to get too bogged down here. But verse 12, if any man builds on the foundation, the foundation is our salvation. Okay? If any man, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12. If any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it's revealed with fire, that's judgment. The fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he receives a reward. So when that fire hits everything that we've done, whatever's left, we're rewarded for that. Oh, okay, you led this one to the Lord. You did this. You did that for the Lord. You'll get crowns, jewels, you get his robe of righteousness to get for salvation. If any man's work is burned up, verse 15, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So it makes it very clear. Nobody's in heaven, the Lord tests their works, and then says, oops, kicks you out of heaven. No, that just doesn't happen. You just might not have much in the way of reward. My mom used to joke her way of putting it was, your robe of righteousness, maybe you've got a mini skirt and somebody else has a flowing robe, <laughs> okay? And again, it's not literal, but it gets the point. What? Okay, now, when we die, when do we go uh, in front of the... The judgment seat, I believe that that will follow the rapture. That when all the believers have been brought up together, then there will be this, this beam of seat. I know, we all go together and take our turns. Yeah, going I, so to speak, yes. Just like all the unsaved will take their turn at the great white throne also. How that happens when we think so finite with time, I don't know. But the God who is above time, who created time for his purposes, mm -hmm will be able to make it fit into what we see as a time period. Because we know if, if I'm right, and it does appear because of where we, we read it in Scripture, that this takes place for us while the tribulation is going on down here, then we know it's done within seven years. Because 
that's how long the tribulation period is. So it's got to be done. We're coming back. He's not going to go, oops, wait a minute. You guys have to wait while we go, you know. So I believe fully that it will be taken care of in that amount of time. How long it would take to judge the unsaved, I don't know. But we won't be dealing with time. We're in going into eternity future. We're not bound by time anymore. Well, because if we don't know um, our judgment, then we can't come down with, with him down from being ruled down here. We will know. And that it, you're right, because we come back in position to judge for him, to rule for him, to serve him. And yes, if you got all your works tried up and there was hardly anything left and you didn't show yourself faithful and you didn't show yourself responsible, there's no way he's going to give you a big assignment during the millennium. You'll get a little assignment. <laughs> but we need our crown so we can throw it at him. When is this going to happen? Um, we see that in... Is it, where is it, in Revelation? Um, it, it could be going on in my mind right now. I'd, I'd have to look again. It could be going on even during the tribulation. It definitely is going on after the tribulation period. Um, I think it's Revelation 5, which is kind of like an interruption. We get a heavenly scene. So, um, and I think we'll... I don't, I don't know how it will work but into, you know, the future. I, I would say from the point that we get them, we can be giving them back to him. Because we might just stand there so thankful that we've got something out of this that we immediately say, Lord, it's yours. Take it. You know, I don't, you know, take it. So at some point, from that point forward, uh, and maybe at different times with different ones. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But we'll be honoring him forever. So, um... Your words and your works, you can judge yourself by. If you notice your words aren't good, you know you need to stand in correction. If you see that you're not doing works that are glorifying the Lord, you know you need to stand in correction. You know you need to, to get back into a right relationship with the Lord. So again, it doesn't release you from, you don't have to worry about what you say or what you do. But you do know that you're released from the judgment that befalls it being the wages of sin is death. That's been relieved. Now, those who want to say that God's going to judge you for them, which, like this, you know, and, and obviously if the Lord's telling them their words are going to judge them, they're the ones that will stand and have their words brought up at the great white throne. But for the believer, what does God say he does with our sins? What does God do with our sins? What does God do? He throw in the in the dippy dip, <laughs> dip, 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 and this gives us the direction of where he gets rid of our sins. Psalm 103, verses 10 to 12. And I'll give you a couple other verses also. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities, also sins. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. That's a believer. A believer has that fear of him, has put their faith in him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Okay, he's cast your sins so far as the east is from the west. East and west never meet. You go east, you're always going east. You go west, you're always going west. They never meet. That's how far your sins go away from you. They never meet you. If it was north and south, you'd meet them. The east and west, you never do. Keep that in mind. Go to Isaiah 38. And even though this was said to Israel, we can draw principle from this. Isaiah 38 and verse 17. Isaiah 38, 17 says, Lo, for my own welfare I had great bitterness. It is you, referring to God, it is you who has kept my soul from the pit of nothingness. You've kept my soul from hell. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. 
So he casts your sins away. He casts them behind his back. He casts them as far as the east is from the west. And then he says in Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What verse was that in 38, 1? Isaiah 38, 17. And then Romans 8, 1. Okay, now, if there's no condemnation, how can you be brought, your words be brought up to judge you? Because that could condemn you. So God is saying, you're never going to be standing there before me being judged for your words as the unsaved will be. Your sins, your words that you shouldn't have spoken, your actions that you shouldn't have done are washed away, are thrown away, are forgotten, are behind God's back, and he never turns around and looks and digs them up. So we are assured time again through Scripture. Israel's assured. We in the, the age of grace are assured. If you're in Yeshua Jesus for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, they're gone. They're, they will never be brought up to judge you. Again, though, doesn't give you a right to go do anything because if you want to please him and serve him and earn reward for him, you're going to want to live right, speak right. You want your heart to be pure before the Lord. You, then you want to speak out of your heart. You're going to speak pure words. You're not going to speak these evil words that you hear around you. But he writes everything down. Right. Again, to to for those who will stand before him in judgment at great white throne yes their words will hang them their actions will hang them they'll have no excuse when they stand before the lord the, what they've said also because how can your words condemn or save you how do you get saved you confess, confess. you ask the lord into your heart now that doesn't mean that if you say it in your mind and not verbally you're not saved i don't mean that but you're using words. Dear Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. Please forgive me for my sin. Whether you say that internally in your mind or whether you speak it out verbally, those words are what are going to save you. Not that they're magic words. That you're putting your faith in the Lord. There's where your salvation comes. But that's how your words save you. If you do not say those words, you leave this earth without ever asking the Lord to be your Savior, then the, your words condemn you. You have put your faith in something else. You have said, you know, something else for, for, you know, I'm a good person or I never did bad things or whatever. Yes. It's like a thief on the cross. Like a what? The thief on the cross. The thief on the cross, yes. He had no chance to do actions to prove a heart change, but he, by his words, acknowledged, you, Lord, don't deserve this. I do. You don't. Have mercy on me. And the Lord said, yes, you'll be in my kingdom with me today. Um, in paradise, sorry, you'll be in paradise with me today. Uh, and we know he went to the the, the non-suffering side of, of Sha'ol at that time. I think I've covered it. Like I said, I don't want to take the whole class, but I think it's very important. Um, by the way, also, remember when you're studying the book of Matthew, and this is true when we go back to Genesis, every book that you're studying, you need to think, who is he writing to? When is he writing? Get into the context. Can we draw principles? Yes. From Genesis to Revelation, we can draw principles. We can learn. Some books help us understand other books. When we look at the book of Matthew, where those words came out of Jesus' mouth, that your words will condemn you, your words, uh, um, whatever he said <laughs> to the Pharisees. Romans, what? 8-1. And that whole chapter of eight is great faith yeah, builder. It, is, the, it absolutely read that whole chapter. Romans is a foundation book. If you are young in this, read and study the book of Romans because it will grow you up in, in your faith. But Matthew was written not to the church, not to the age of grace. In Matthew, you don't find the rapture. Remember, people tried to put it in chapter 24, and I showed you how that's judgment going into the millennium that has nothing to do with rapture. It's all right. Rapture was not taught, not known, until we get into the church age, until we get Paul raised up, who brings <clears throat> the message to those of us living in this age of grace right now. Church age and age of grace are synonymous. So knowing that there is no rapture mentioned in Matthew, 
and that the Lord is speaking to them of only what they know. They know there's a coming judgment, but they don't know of a coming rapture for believers to go up, receive reward, and come back down. All that's, they had no view, no view of it. You know, they all they saw was all the way to the end, the judgment John, at the John, end. I mean, God Paul. Reveal all of this to John? Yes, to John and to Paul in his letters that he writes to us also. That's where we get, you know, the, the clarity that, that's given to us. And if you keep that in mind when you go through the Gospels, it will really help you. Because that's where we get a lot of ideas that kind of get us off and get us in trouble, put us back under law and back under judgment because the Gospels were written under law and judgment you know that, that that was on the lord came under the law kept the law you know he was the only one who could but it, it all the way through we have to see and remember that that that's where this comes from so when he's speaking to the pharisees and saying those words are going to condemn you one day in judgment he's not talking about the bema seat he's not talking about when believers are going to be standing there for reward or loss of reward. He's talking about when those Pharisees stand before God, if they never came to believe in Yeshua Jesus, they'll stand before God at that great white throne judgment at the end, and their very own words will be brought up. You equated what I did with the power of Satan. You didn't receive me as the Son of God. You did not see me as a sacrificial lamb. You didn't accept me as the one who could forgive your sins. You stand in your sins condemned. Your very own words say it. Boom, what can they say? What can they say? So that's where we get that they're judged for every idle word that comes out of their mouths. We are not judged for it. But do you think a good parent corrects a child who speaks badly right at the time? Good parent does. Good parent's going to call their child out. You don't talk like that. Don't talk disrespectfully to so-and-so. Don't say those words. Okay, you said something so bad, I'm going to show you, you got a dirty mouth. Let's wash your mouth out with soap, <laughs> okay? There are different ways a good parent has corrected a child at the time for their words. You speak idle words now, you got a great parent who's going to call you up short right now and help you get corrected so that you can speak in a way that is honorable to him. That's going to happen now. Not wait for a judgment. That's going to happen now. So if you, if you thought you had a get-out-of-jail-free card, <laughs> just yank your chain. <laughs> okay? Are we good? Questions? Comments? Okay. Very good. Then hopefully that helps that. Now, let's jump into Genesis and see how much we can redeem. I'd like us to take our whole story. We'll see if we can. If we can't, we won't. But for those of you who get um, text reminders, I mentioned for class today that we would be talking about a whole family. Mm -hmm. we, would, we would, how did I put it? I said it better than I can at the moment. Just a second and I'll read it to you. <laughs> uh, because that will make it easier. Okay, I said, Isaac's household, spiritual or carnal? Who acts upon which inclination? on the inclination to be spiritual or be carnal. What was God's response to each one due to their actions? And the answer might surprise you. So, as we go into this, we're going to look at the family of four, Yitzhak and Rivka, Esau and Yaakov, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Esau. We're going to back up to verse 1 of chapter 27 just to get the whole thought. We know what we're building toward. We're building toward that time that the birthright is going to uh, be given, be established, the blessing that goes along with it. Um, because Jacob, I'm sorry, Isaac thinks he's dying. Yeah, it's Isaac, yeah. Yeah, Isaac thinks he's dying, okay? So let me read, uh, let's see, which do I want to do first? We're talking about the spiritual and the cardinal of Isaac and the family. Right, right. Okay, so let me give you the timeline just in synopsis. I gave you more last time, but some of you got a little confused, so I tried to simplify. From the time of Avraham being born that we know of, and the time of, of Jacob's death, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So from the beginning of Abraham 
to the ending of Jacob, we've got about 300 years. Okay, a little over. Abraham is 100 years old when Isaac is born. Okay, remember Sarah is 90, Abraham's 100. He left Haran at 75. 25 years later, he finally has Isaac, his son of promise. Now, Isaac gets married to Rebecca, and they have their first babies, plural, because they have twins. When Isaac is how old? Do we remember? 30. No. Nope. Isaac is... Nope. Nope. Isaac is... 80. 40-something? Nope. 50-something? Nope. 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 nope, nope, nope. Is it I'll help you. Isaac is 60 okay. when the twins are born. Yeah. Okay? Abraham was 100 when Isaac was born. Isaac's only 60 when Jacob and Esau are born. So if Abraham was 100 and Isaac is 60, then Abraham is 160 years old when Jacob and Esau are born. Okay, Abraham dies at 175. So he has 15 years with Jacob and Esau. He's got more than that with, with Isaac, you know, but he's got his influence in person comes down that far. Many of you today grew up with grandparents who passed away sometime during your childhood. Well, Jacob and Esau were 15 when Abraham died. Isaac is going to make it to 180. We're going to see right now he's about 135 to 36, 37, somewhere in there. So he's got over 40 years to go, but he doesn't think so, okay? If he dies at 180 and he was 60 when he had Jacob, then Jacob is 120 when his dad dies. So what? Okay. How old was Isaac's dad? He was at 160, right? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Now Jacob's going to live 147 years. We'll find out he has Joseph, not his firstborn. He has Joseph when he's about 91 years of age. We'll see that as we move down and get into Joseph's life. Uh, but it makes Joseph around 57 when his father Jacob dies. Okay, just to give you that, you know, we stretch him out and we think like Abraham's gone off the scene and then we've got Isaac and now Isaac's going to go off the scene and we have Jacob. But no, their lives were, were running simultaneously with each other. Okay, so... By this point here, um, we know that, that we've buried Abraham. We've not buried Isaac yet. And that's where our story is taking place. In the beginning of, of chapter 27, it says, Now it came about when Yitzhak, Isaac, was old, and his eyes were too dim to see, that he called his older son Esau and said to him, my son. Before I go any further than that, I taught this last time, so just real quickly, his eyes getting dim, we see a double play here. Yes, he was aging, but the idea to give us here is spiritually, his eyes were dim. They were not, he's not in a good place spiritually. This one who was a giant spiritually earlier, we're going to see him really in a backslidden state here. Okay, word to the wise. You can be spiritually right with the Lord today, and you can slip tomorrow. You need to always be working on your relationship with the Lord and take nothing for granted. So, he called his son Esau, the older of the two twins, and he said, My son, and Esau said, Here am I, and Isaac said, Behold, I'm old. I don't know the day of my death. I think I'm dying, Esau. I think this is it. So, verse 3, please take your gear, your quiver, your bow, go out to the field, hunt game for me. Remember, Isaac loved Esau. He man, hunter, man's man. He loved the wild game that, that he would eat. That was what appealed to him. And Yaakov, Jacob, was more hanging around the tent, studying the word of God, you know, more of a tender person. Being a chef. <laughs> he would be a bookworm today <laughs> compared to a baseball player or a sportsman, okay? Just to give you, you know, the contrast between the two. Ask you one question. Uh, if he was reading his Bible, or uh, reading the, the scrolls in those days, do you think he would have went ahead and did what his mother, you know, did? I think as we develop, we'll answer that question and we'll see. And I really shouldn't say he was reading his scrolls because they didn't have them like we do. 
you know, they were, uh, we know Moshe is going to write all this down. We know there were records being kept. But remember, God walked and talked with Abraham. Then we heard that God talked with Isaac. We're going to learn when God talks with Jacob. So there was a difference in a relationship there than what we have now. And they didn't have the spirit indwelling them like we have now. We've talked about that before too. But obviously if Isaac's dim spiritually, he's not in the close fellowship with the Lord and being directed by the Lord and what he's doing. He's doing things in his That's own what flesh. That's what, That's means. what it means. That's the idea that we're given. Okay? So he tells him, go hunt game. Verse 4, prepare a delicious meal for me as I love. Bring me that meal so that I may eat it, and then my soul will bless you before I die. <laughs> okay, that blessing is a spiritual blessing. If Isaac is about to give out something spiritual, what he really should have been doing was getting very close to God. Spending time in fellowship with God, hearing the voice of God, being directed by God, filling himself with God and God's word, not with the flesh. Instead, he's on the opposite side, and he's filling up his carnal side. Oh, if I've got a good meal in my belly, I can really bless you. I'll have strength that I don't have right now. I'm weak because I'm hungry. Now, I'll ask without expecting an answer, but many of you may have had a time when there was something big coming up that you needed to do that was of spiritual importance. If you felt directed by the Lord, you may have even gone into a time of fasting, not into a time of eating. We deny the flesh so that the spirit can really take over and be in control where our whole mind and our whole focus is. And we see the exact opposite in Isaac. His whole mind and his whole, whole focus is on this he-man and this world and the, the, the let me have, you know, let me have a good last meal, you know, and I'll give you a good blessing, you know, while I'm feeling really good and really content. So it just shows he really was not where he would be listening and hearing the voice of the Lord. He's really full of himself. Okay, now Rebecca, Rivka, where is she? She was listening while Yitzhak, Isaac, spoke to his son Esau. The way this is phrased is she was not right there in the room, the three of them there, hearing it. She overheard. She's probably, you know, right behind the tent flap or, you know, real close in proximity. But Isaac's literal eyes are dim. And all he wants is his son Esau. That's all he's looking for, just his son. Okay, so that's first indication that Isaac is doing this without telling Rebecca. Now, why would he not tell his wife? Normally, this would be a very ceremonial time. The ceremonies usually had a feast. So there's his food, there's his appetite. But usually a big deal was made out of something that was so important as this, a rite of passage. We see it when kids graduate today. We see it in the Jewish world when the, the boy turns 13 and gets a bar mitzvah. They don't do it privately. They don't do it just between the father and son. They invite the family from all over. They send out invitations. They expect everybody to come. It's a big deal. He's not only not sending the word out, He's not even letting his wife know what he's doing. And that's wrong, right? I think that's a big mistake, yes. Why wouldn't he want Rebecca to know? What would Rebecca have said? No. Wait a minute, honey. <laughs> Remember when the babies were in my womb and God said the younger was to receive the blessing that the older would serve the younger? Remember, God's will and God's way is that the younger receives this blessing, not the older. She would have given him grief. Now, some will say, oh, that's because Rebecca loved Jacob, and he was her favorite, and she wanted her favorite to get it, and Isaac wanted his favorite to get it. Some of that may be true, but I don't think. I think it's even more. Rebecca is the one that God directly told. You've got two you've got two nations in you they're at war this is the results but she 
obviously would have shared that with her husband before the children were born. It would have been known this was God's will and God's way. And by Isaac not including her, he probably knew he'd get grief from her, so he just thought, I'm just going to take care of it before my wife can put her two cents worth in. Okay? Is it possible you know, she could have, after Esau left, went in and expressed to her husband, you know, what the Lord said, before she be saving? Couldn't she have done that? Rebecca had a choice to make. All four have choices to make. Isaac's just made a choice. I want Esau to get the blessing. Go get me food. I'm going to bless you. Rebecca could have right then, oh Lord, on her knees, we've got a problem. You know he's about to bless the wrong son. Stop him from doing it. Intervene. Whatever. Rebecca didn't need to figure out a way to make it work. She needed to turn it to the Lord. That's her mistake. Instead of going to the Lord, trusting the Lord in that moment, and granted, she doesn't have long because we see the story moves very quickly, the, the game is found, the meal is made, boom, you know, it's, it's not a long time. But that teaches us, in a moment of crisis, don't try to figure it out. Oh, okay, I'll take it into my own hands, I'll do it this way. I know what God wants, so this is how we can get it done. So I think she had the right intent. I know what God wants, but she had the wrong way of carrying it out. She looked to herself instead of just pleading with the Lord. I guarantee you the Lord would have intervened because the Lord's will would not be thwarted. And this was so important because this one who gets this blessing and this birthright is the one who passes it down to the next, to the next, and it had to be the godly line that was going to lead to the Messiah. God kept that pure all the way. It could not go to what would end up going into a mix of heathendom. It had to stay in the spiritual. So God would have intervened. He would have pulled Isaac up short one way or another. But Rebecca didn't give God the chance to work it his way. She took it into her own hands. So that's what we see happens, and we get that in verse 6. And that's her flesh that got in the way. That's her flesh. Her flesh got in the way. The carnal got in the way. Okay, but all through our six life, it never showed her that he was godly. We see him godly when we see that he was willing to lay down his life and sacrifice with, along with his father. He didn't battle it. He didn't get up and run away. He didn't say, I'm done with you, old man. <laughs> you know, because he was an adult. He yeah. could have done anything. We see that when he, all the wells that we looked at, we saw that he didn't have a spirit to fight and be contentious with those around him. He sought to, to live peaceably with men as much as he could. But we saw finally he moved back into the land of promise, and there he built an altar, and the Lord met him there. So there we see his spiritual. So, yes, he, he really gleaned a lot in his life under the covering of Abraham's blessing, that spiritual blessing that fell on Isaac, and we see that continually. Even we today receive spiritual blessing just because we're his children, not because we've earned it, you know, but because God is giving it to us. But I believe Isaac had peaks of great spiritual strength, eyesight, acted right. He was a great picture of the Lord, foreshadowing the Lord at different times. But here we see his carnality. In this chapter, we see him pulled up short. And we'll see he catches that in the end. If we, if we get there, and I think we will, we'll see it today. If not, remind me at the end of class, and I'll tell you. I'll give you that sneak peek. But, um, but yes. At this point, his actions are, are showing carnal, the dim eyes, the dim spiritually. Rebecca's just shown her lack of trust in God at a moment of crisis. Very easy at a moment of crisis to jump and take things in our own hands. So a lesson to learn. We don't want to be spiritually dim so that we're ready to handle a crisis. And in a crisis, we want to cry out to the Lord and allow Him to work. His ways above our ways. His thoughts above, above our thoughts. Allow him instead of taking it into our own hands. But Rebecca does. Isaac goes into the field, verse 5. Um, when, so when Isaac went to the field to hunt game, to bring home, Rivka, Rebecca said to her son Yaakov, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying. So in other words, she went and found Jacob, 
and she said, hey, come here, listen, listen to me. I've heard this. Your dad is about to bless your brother. He told him to go out and get food. I guess I need to read that. Verse 7, bring me some game, prepare a delicious meal for me so that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. That means this is that blessing that goes along with that birthright that seals the deal. But they're just, I mean, they're real young for him to die. He's just acting like he's going to die. He, he thinks he's going to die. Yeah, because, well, okay. Remember? Didn't this happen before, um, they're, they're not even married yet or anything. They're not they're married young. yet, but they don't marry early either. Yeah. Okay, they are probably close to 60 years of age. The twins? The twins. Oh. The twins, yeah. I guess I haven't gotten to that yet in our, or I did and forgot to bring oh, okay. it out this week, okay. one or the other. But if Isaac is 137, that begins to give us the age of the twins. We know that Rebecca didn't get pregnant right away. We know he got married at 40, and they, Isaac finally had um, the twins when he was 60. So if he's 137 now, 60, they, so they were closer to 70. They were closer to 70 years of age, okay? So they're not young. They're not bar mitzvah age, 13. They're not our age of graduating from high school at 18 and going out into the world. They're, they're six, in their 60s, headed for 70. And, of course, they're going to live longer, but, but they're, they're aged. Oh, okay. You know, oh. So, yeah, they just didn't marry young, Okay. Um, so we've got, you know, um, I think we've said it. Okay, keep asking me questions, anything I'm missing, keep asking or that you're wondering. So she, she knows that, um, uh, I got to jump back in here. Bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Okay, again, remember Isaac's half-brother, Ishmael, died at 137. Isaac is 137. He could have easily thought, my time has come too. You know, it wasn't that he was being presumptuous. He must have felt old. He must have felt like he was wearing out. He wasn't. He goes on, you know, a number of years more. But he, he had reason. He wasn't a youngster saying, I'm dying. So he wants them to do that. I'm picking up now in verse 8. So Rebecca is speaking. Now, my son, listen to me as I command you, Okay. Rebecca did take the lead. She said, I'm telling you what to do. Obey me. This is what you should do. Go to the flock. That's their flock. Bring me two choice young goats from there so I may prepare them as a delicious meal for your father such as he loves. This is why we get the indication if Rebecca could take, or Jacob, could take goats from their flock. They're not the wild goats. Esau's going to go hunt the wild goat. But it isn't that the taste is so different because Rebecca's going to season it up, spice it up, and he's not going to know the difference. So it wasn't really that he liked wild food better than farm food, I'll put it that way. But it was, again, he just, he probably would live vicariously through Esau. You know, give me one more, you know, he-man, go out and get, you know, hunt it down and, and show me how powerful and strong and what, what a man's man you are. That's where his interest was because Rebecca very easily fools him with the meal. He eats the meal. He thinks it's delicious. He's fully satisfied. He didn't say, hmm, this doesn't taste wild. This tastes like the tame food. So it wasn't the taste. It's the action. He, he's just... It's like today, you see people look at somebody today and they really think, wow, that's the one to hold up on the pedestal. And what do they pick? A Hollywood star, a, a sports star, a, you know, someone who succeeded <clears throat> in great ways. They're not going to pick that pastor who's pouring his whole heart and life out in the pulpit and to his little flock and isn't even known. By world standards, they're a nobody. By the earth, the world, you know, looking at, these are the he men. So it, it's just that separation. Isaac didn't have his eyes in the right place. His eyes were drawn to what the world says. Wow, look at that. The world around them, the rest of the servants and all, probably had great respect for Esau. He's a man. And they probably thought Jacob's a bit wimpy. <laughs> okay? Just the contrast. Yes? She also covered his arms. 
We're getting there. You guys know the story. That's <laughs> half your problem. <laughs> okay, so let's read it. Um, I'll prepare the food such as your father loves. Verse 10. Then you shall bring it to your father that he may eat it, so he may bless you before his death. Here, quick, shortcut. Go get the goats from, from our farm. Mm -hmm. We'll prepare it quickly. You'll get in there with a the meal while Esau's still out hunting and preparing it. Because the whole time it takes Esau to go hunt, bring that animal home, prepare that animal, they would be that much ahead. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's what to do. But Jacob says, wait a minute, Mom. <laughs> he says to his mother, Rebecca, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. Remember, even when they were born, that was the description. Esau was hairy all over. Jacob was very smooth. And you've all seen it. Some men are hairy, hair on their chest. Others are bare-chested, okay? And usually it's the hairy that gets that he-man look. Not always, but usually. So, Jacob's worried about that. He says, perhaps, verse 12, my father will touch me. Then I'll be like a deceiver in his sight. I'll bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. So what we have now is Jacob's realizing, wait a minute, this isn't going to work, Mom. He's going to know if I'm Jacob. And then I'll get in trouble. He's going to give a curse to me, not a blessing to me. Okay, now, I want to make sure I made clear, again, if Rebecca had waited on the Lord here, the Lord would have accomplished it without her taking it into her own hands. And she's going to suffer the results of her fleshly action because she's going to see, had she waited on the Lord, by the end of this episode, there would have been a house full of spiritual joy of the will of the Lord being done. It would have been wonderful. Instead, she is going to reap the sorrow of seeing the son that she's closest to have to leave and leave long enough, we don't have recorded whether she got to see him again or not. She may have, but we never have it recorded for us in scripture. So if she would have looked even, how did God intervene? When Avraham was going to offer up Yitzhak, God provided the lamb. What would he have done? How would he have done it? I'd love to know. That's a question I'm gonna ask, Lord, if, I think I'm gonna ask, I may not. <laughs> But I think, Lord, if Rebecca hadn't entered into the picture, what would you have done? What would we have seen? I think it could have been another, wow, look at the parting of the Red Sea. But instead, we've got what man did. Yes, Loretta. Can you imagine what's the difference between uh, a goat's hair compared to a man that's... I'll explain that. I'll explain that. I love the thinking. You're right on thinking. I'll explain it in a moment. Let me give you a reference. The second. Good enough. I'll explain. I'll explain. Second Timothy two thirteen. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Second Timothy. Second Timothy three thirteen. It is in your cross references. Sorry, two, two, two. Is it two? Wait a minute. Yeah, 2.13. Oh, and it is in your cross-references. I did give it to you. I didn't just throw one in is. on a curve. There right. you go. That's so important for us to hold on to. If we're faithless, Lord, I'm shaking in my boots. I'm scared to death. I don't see how anything can happen. It seems impossible. <laughs> then remind yourself with God all things are possible. Look to God. Give him a chance. He will remain faithful. He will not deny himself. That's what Rebecca should have done. She would have seen the ram in the thicket. She would have seen the party of the Red Sea. She would have seen something. But instead, she reaps the consequences of her own actions. The result, in the end, the right son gets blessed, but she's going to have to part ways with him. There's a lot of sorrow and a lot of grief because she didn't <coughs> rely on the Lord. She how, relied on herself. How old was Rebecca when you was does it just say Isaac? Or yeah, I don't think we know Rebecca's age, but she didn't have children right away. She was not a child bride. I think, I think, I think we knew she was close to Isaac's age when she came. So she would be still close <coughs> to sixty herself. I mean, maybe fifty. <laughs> she was sixty when she. She no. probably was. She was somewhere between forty and sixty. I'm gonna say when the twins were born. So, and now we've got, so if Isaac's 137, she's probably at least in her 120s, at least. Wow. Huh. 
And does it say doesn't say how old she was when she died? We don't even have her death recorded. Okay. So we don't have an age. No. It's Sarah. No. Sarah, Sarah, we get more recorded. We get, um, I think it's the only woman that's age is told at death. Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. Something like that runs my, female, female, I'm sorry, only women, you know, whose well, age is told on her. Moses was so special, and that's his mate, David. Moses? Abraham. 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 <laughs> okay. That's okay. My mom was teaching one day and she put Jonah in the belly. No, she put Noah in the belly of the whale and she knew better. So I get your. <laughs> we know you know better, but yeah. Okay. Um, for whatever reason. We, we're not told about Rebecca's death, but when we read of Isaac's death and the boys come because of Isaac's death, we have no record of Rebecca at that time, so it's presumed she died before him. We know she was buried in the cave of Machpelah because we have that recorded for us. The, so we know where she was buried, we just don't know when. But it sounds like in the order, it would have been Sarah, Abraham, Rebecca, Jake, uh, Isaac. And then we come down to, um, do we know that, well, I'm trying to think, do we know Leah goes before Jacob? We know Rachel does, but she's not in the cave of Machpelah that she would be the next one that, that dies in that order of those people. So back on track, though, okay. okay? Back to where we want to be and making sure I'm telling you everything that I should have. Okay, notice in verse 8, she, she basically commanded um, Jacob. She, the, it's very <laughs> strong in the Hebrew. She's pulling up her mama card. <laughs> you may be in an adult, but do what I'm telling you to do, son. You know, she, she's really leading this. And uh, again, um, I've told you about how they could cheat, hurry, and go get the goat and all. And so now we're into Jacob. Admitting that, that this is deception, he realizes it. He's scared that's going to reap evil results. Um, but he, even when he brings it up to his mom, she tells him basically not to worry about it. We'll see what she does in a moment. But she, t well, let's just take it in order because I don't want to get out of order. So it'll be easier if I stay in order. Okay, so Jacob in verse 11 says, he's hairy and I'm smooth. Verse 12, maybe he'll know I'm deceiving and I'll get cursed. Verse 13, and that deceiver, when it says that, that okay, I lost it. I will be like a deceiver in his sight. That would be one that's trifling with the fact that his dad is almost blind. It would be kind of like mocking him. You know, I'm making a mockery out of my dad by, by pulling the wool over his eyes. <laughs> Put that in quotes, but that's what he's thinking. Rebecca is very determined, though. She says in verse 13, your curse be on me, my son. There you go. In other words, she's saying, I'll take the full responsibility. Where the buck stops, let it stop with me. If there's a, a curse that's to come because of what we're doing, let it fall on me. You need to do this. She was so determined, wow. okay? So she was willing to take even a, a repercussion on herself. Um, again, she's going to hinder seeing the work of God because she's going to jump in and get in the way. Um, she should have stopped right there and beseeched him and trusted him. Even Jacob's words should have helped wake her up. Hey, wait a minute, we really shouldn't be trying to do this. Now, it could be that she felt so strong about what the end results need to be that she was in her mind feeling that the end justifies the means. Again, we tend to do that sometimes too. Um, she could have even thought, if Isaac blesses the wrong son, he's going to get the wrath of God on him. I'm going to spare my husband making a big mistake here and getting in trouble. Who knows what she said to justify it in her own mind. But the interesting thing to note, even though we're bringing out very clearly, she's in her flesh doing this. Jacob's going to be in his flesh following through. He's, he doesn't stop and take it to God either and look for the right. You know, they just act but we're going to notice there's never a rebuke given by God to Rebecca and Jacob you know we saw God rebuke Abraham with Abimelech we saw God rebuke Isaac with Abimelech we don't see it here that doesn't mean that God was saying oh this is okay 
but it's just interesting that who we want to shred and take, you know, say, oh, bad, 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 bad. Take your cues from the Lord and see how the Lord responds to each of these people. So, um, she, and I'll bring you out a little more why she might have been doing what she was doing, but right now in verse, um, where are we? I'm trying to stay in order. Okay. Obey my voice, verse 13. Go get the goats for me. So he went and he got them, brought them to his mother, and his mother made a delicious meal such as his father loved. She's pulling it off. Then Rebekah took the best garments of her elder son Esau. I'm sure Esau had his own tent. Jacob had his own tent. Okay? Mama probably didn't do the wash for both. <laughs> so she probably went, got, went to his tent, snuck out his clothes for Jacob to put on. She put, she, um, Rebecca got the best of the garments, which were with her. In, oh, they were with her in the house. Excuse me. She didn't go to Esau's tent. Maybe she was doing his wash. <laughs> okay. Anyway, she gets um, Esau's clothes and she puts them on Jacob. Here, put your brother's clothes on. Then verse were, 16. I thought they were big. <laughs> Probably were. Maybe rolled up the sleeves. Who knows? Yeah. Verse 16. She, then she put the skins of the young goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. So he had short hair enough that um, Isaac could feel his neck and his um, arms. Is that what? His hands. Okay. So she put the skins from the goats, which would be rough. She put those somehow, glued those somehow onto his hands and onto his neck. And then she also, where does it say? I guess it's coming. I know too much too. I gotta <laughs> stay in order. Um, she also gave a delicious meal and the bread which she'd made to her son Jacob. So she's made his skin rough. She's fixed the food. She's put Esau's clothes on him. Now she's pushing men. Go in, go in your dad. Go, 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 go. Um, okay, this is where I'll bring it out. When she put the skin on, remember um, Esau was hairy. So it wouldn't have been just skin like a hide. It would have been the skin, I don't want to get gross, but let's say that the, the animals, that they skinned the animals, then the hair would have come with it. In those days, and even down to Roman times, they substituted human hair with these goats that, that they had. They had such fine hair that it was like human hair. So I think today how we take sim, sim, synthesize, what do we call it? Not synthetic. Synthetic. Got it. We take synthetic to make hair for our wigs. They took goat hair and made wigs. So if somebody needed hair for whatever reason, that's how they did it. So when the skin was put on, it made it rough. It also had the hair that must have been a lot like Esau's hair. Well, that makes sense. So there you go. So she's thinking it through, oh, I can cover up all of this. We'll put Esau's clothes on. We'll put goat's hair on. The skin will be rough. You know, he'll feel like Esau. He'll smell like Esau. And as much as his dad can see, he'll look like Esau. So we've got a winning team here, and then I'll bring in the food the way Esau would make it. We got your dad fooled. That's where she was at. Okay, so... That's what she does, and she sends him in. And he goes in in verse 18. He came to his father, to Isaac, and he said, My father, and I can only imagine, their voices were probably similar, their brothers. Maybe one was a little deep or whatever, and I can imagine Isaac trying to sound like his brother. <coughs> Hello, Dad. <laughs> Joel, Dad. Okay. Here, here I am. Well, Isaac can't see well. Maybe his hearing is a little fogged too. Maybe he thought it doesn't sound quite right, but I know I sent Esau out. Who knows what he's thinking? But he does say, who are you, my son? And that's when Jacob steps in it. He says to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Come now, sit and eat of my game so that you may bless me. I picture in our vernacular today, Isaac sitting in a lazy boy chair and the table's across the room. <laughs> Jacob's come in, he's thinking, I don't want to get too close. I know dad can't see well. You know, let's let's not go over and help dad to the table. But come on, dad, come to the table. Here's your food. And with everything, the smell of the food that, that's smelling right and 
and the, the picture that he would see with whatever sight he did have, because he was not totally blind, his eyes were dim, but not blinded, then he's thinking, okay, we can, we can pull this up. So come on, come eat so that you can bless me, because he knew that was Isaac's intent. Rebecca had told him, okay? So Isaac says to his son, how is it that you've done it so quickly, my son? Remember, Jacob and his mom took the shortcut. They got the goat out of their flocks rather than having to go hunt it down. So that time, Isaac's saying, wow, you really did it fast, Esau. How'd you pull that one off? And here's where one lie usually begets another lie. And so here we go. And so now Jacob really steps in it. And how did he do it so quickly? He says, because the Lord your God made it come to me. Now he's bringing the Lord in. Oh, the Lord helped me find that king. Help me get one real fast. That's another big step, okay? A big, oops, that should not have been. Um, again, their strategy is totally wrong. Their deception is totally wrong. But they probably are thinking it's the ends going to justify the means because what Isaac and Esau wanted to do was even more grievously wrong because it would have interfered with the line to the Messiah. And that's a greater, more, what's the word I want? That, that's worse. Okay, so what Esau and Isaac are wanting to do is worse than what Jacob and Rebekah are doing. And that's probably what they thought. Let me give you why I think they could have begun to justify it in their mind, not saying it's right. But let's go back to the time of Moses. This is after them. This could not have been in their favor, but this helps us understand. What I have to stand corrected. In Exodus chapter 1, and I'm not going to read it, but in Shemot chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, you have the Hebrew midwives deliberately disobey the king of Egypt. They blatantly lied to him. They were told when the Israeli women are giving birth and it's a male child, they were to kill the male child. Well, they didn't want to do this. So they lied to the Pharaoh and they said, oh, the Hebrew wives, they're so strong. They're having their babies fast. By the time we get there, the baby's already born. It's too late. We can't do anything. Okay? That was a lie to keep from taking the lives of those babies. So, you know, they justified lying, thinking this is right because it, it spares life. Rahab, Rahab, the, the, the uh, harlot, hid the spies in a roof. Oh, they're not here, they're out there. You know, she lied again, thinking that she was doing right because she's hiding the men of God rather than allowing them to be caught. And we have other times like this in Scripture. That's Joshua chapter 2, by the way, if you want to read it, and in Joshua chapter 6, verse 25. So sometimes it can seem that lines justified, but the principles or the purposes of God are sacrificed when we lie. You know, it, the end doesn't justify the means. <clears throat> this is where we need to trust God. Now, I'm not saying Rahab did wrong. I'm not saying those who hid Jews in the Holocaust and told the Nazis there's no Jews in our house when they were hiding Jews. I'm not saying that's wrong. That's not my point. But it shows us how we all justify. And that's what I think they were doing. What Isaac was going to do would be so wrong and the hand of God would be so grievous against Isaac that I think it made Rebecca think this is, a, this is a white lie, that's a black lie. You know, that type of idea. That's what I'm trying to get across. Um, how God would work, I have no idea. Again, I, I thank those who saved and hid Jews and lied about it. You know, I can't call it out and say it's wrong. I can't call out and say this is wrong, except we know it wasn't trusting the Lord. And we see the progress of deception. First, he impersonates his brother. Then he lies to his father, and then he brings God into it. You know, God helped him do it. So we see the progress go down. If you look at Psalm at Tehillim chapter 1, verses 1 and following, you see the one who walks in the counsel of the ungodly, and then he's standing in the way of sinners, and eventually he's seated in the seat of the scornful. That shows you three steps down. 
first you're, you're around it, then you're starting to associate with it, then you're having fellowship with it. We should never open that door. We shouldn't think that the end is okay to justify the means. We should always be truthful and we should always trust the Lord. But I understand that at times these people didn't, is what I'm trying to say. And again, notice how God saves Rahab, Rahab, puts her in the line to the Messiah. You know, God um, spared Moses, Moshe, when he should have been killed through deception, through hiding him. So we see that I don't want, I'm, I'm really struggling for the right way to say it. I'm not saying God overlooks. I'm not saying that, you know, he's winking at this. But again, we don't see him shred Rebecca and shred Jacob. So I think he had to have seen the intent in their heart was right, but their actions were wrong. Can I put it that way? But they both okay. paid for And they both paid for it. Absolutely, so they, they paid for yeah. it. Yes, they if they money. hadn't taken it into their own hands. Is it, is it that? Okay. 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 Sorry, folks. We had gardeners in the front and we closed off the front of the house. Now we've got gardeners behind our house and we're closing off the back. And the people in the house are pleading, don't, it'll be too hot. So, do for the sake of the video, that's what's going on. Roger's going to put air on in the house so you all will be comfortable still and we can have not have the sound of the lawnmower over my voice on the recording. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, no, no, no. Just want, I want everybody to understand. Um, but just so you get the point, the best thing they could have done was go to the Lord. We don't see that. But realize, we too, we need to always go to the Lord. That's the best that we should do. But when we have taken things into our own hands, we don't have to think, well, I blew it now. God will have nothing to do with me. It's all over. We don't see that. God's going to work in their lives still. God's going to work in Jacob's life wonderfully. Yes, he has to go out. We know that, okay, because you know the story. You know what's coming. You know he's going to leave home, and he's going to be gone for about 20 years. And that's a long space of time to be gone from your family. But what's he get out of it? He gets his wife. He gets another wife, too. But we're ahead of the story. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I have heard that in the Old Testament, God always believed that sin. I've always been told that. Or he justified it. He didn't. I can't say that. Did you say he didn't I can't say that. We had sin in the old because uh, of the people or. Look at Uzziah. Or, Uzziah know. touched the Ark of the Covenant to keep it from falling. When they were carrying it the wrong way, mm -hmm. they had it on a cart instead of on the shoulders of the priests. And the cart hit a bump and it started to fall and Uzziah set his hand out to, to stable the ark. You. you would think that's something right. You know, he didn't want the ark, the precious ark of, of the covenant of, um, from the tabernacle, he didn't want that to fall and be hurt. But yet God instantly, he lost his life. Eli's two sons took strange fire before the Lord and boom, immediately lost their lives. I don't see God winking at sin in the in the original. I, I'm not going to agree with that. Um, sin is just always wrong. What we do see is the same thing we say we as believers. When we fall, God's grace abounds. We should not fall thinking, oh, well, God's grace will abound. I'm okay. It should keep us, you know, in line. But we do see the grace of God is still there. And by the grace of God, he still uses Jacob. He still blesses Rebecca. You know, it's not the end. It's not all over. And that's my point for us. We can't live perfectly. As much as within us, we should. But God understands us. He understands our human circumstances. And he will grow us in them. And I do believe they probably grew in the Lord a lot through this and did better in trials coming down the line than what they did at this point. But here we are. So um, before I lose all my audience, let's see how far we can get real quick. In verse 22, um, okay, sorry, we are not, we must be 20. Yeah, he tells him in 19, come sit, eat of the game, and then you can bless me. 
Isaac said to his son, oh, I, we did that. How has it got us so quickly? Because the Lord brought it to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come close so I may feel you, my son, whether you really are my son Esau or not. So he's kind of catching on. Something's not quite right here. Something's not quite kosher. But he tells him to come. And so it's a good thing Rebecca did as far as they would be concerned what she did because he he does oh he, he tells them the voice is the voice of Jacob but the hands oh no 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 I, I'm sorry I'm a mess today verse 22 so Jacob came close to his father Isaac he touched him and said the voice is the voice of Jacob but the hands are the hands of Esau so you know Rebecca knew what Esau's hair looked like and felt like and she got a close proximity and it did fool Isaac he said well uh, what I'm hearing isn't right but what I'm feeling is right so he blessed him he said are you really my son Esau and Jacob answers I am again he's having to lie to to cover up so verse 25 he said bring it to me I will eat of my son's game that I may bless you and he brought it to him and he ate and he also brought him wine and he drank so he filled him up with a good meal he did bring it right to him he's not afraid of being close to him now because he's already been close and been touched and passed off you know everything seems good um, so he he fills him up with all that physical carnal food wine everything verse 26 and his father Isaac said to him please come close and kiss me my son that's just you know, come give me a hug we'd say today the kiss was was in that line, you know, it was, it was appropriate and proper. So Jacob, in verse 27, came close and he kissed him. And when he smelled the smells of his garments, he blessed him. So basically what I see, and I could be wrong, but I think Isaac's in a sitting position. Jacob came over, leaned over, hugged and kissed his dad, maybe kissed his dad on the forehead. And his clothes being Esau's clothes, that smell would be right where the nose and everything is. And so he's smelling that, he's happy, he's got that meal. And so he is ready to bless him. And he says, see, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which Lord is blessed. You smell like outdoors. You smell like Esau to me. So now may the god of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine i miss give you didn't i now may god give you the dew of heaven the fatness of the earth abundance of grain and new wine okay so isaac now has put his senses before god he's not going by spiritual senses he's going by his physical senses and anytime we do that also, we've got to be in our spirit, sensing and following the will of the Lord. Not our eyes, not our smell, not our taste, not all of our human, even our hearing. Everything was fooling him at this point. He needed to be in his spiritual state and he wasn't. So out of that, he is going to bring this blessing and he starts off with national blessings. This is a gift from God, the dew of heaven, that would be rain, that would be the moisture to, to have good pastures, to have good crops, the fatness of the earth, the material prosperity, fruitful soil. These words are echoing part of what God gave to Abraham when he made covenant with Abraham all the way back in chapter 12. But we've looked before because I'm hurrying to finish this section. I won't go back there now. You can on your own. The next couple of verses, he's going to bless him with power and rule, rule, rule okay the one who's going to rule remember God had made it specific the younger I'm sorry the elder would serve the younger that means the elder would be ruled by the younger the opposite order of the natural and Isaac knew this but here's where he's blundering because he thinks he's blessing Esau and he says in verse 29 may peoples serve you may nations bow down to you may be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you so all your brothers all your family everybody's to bow down to you people are to serve you the nations are to bow down to you he's lifting them up to full dominion and power among people and among his own family his own brethren if you have the words master or lord either one is that rulership 
So now he has literally given rulership over his brethren in direct opposition to God's statement. God, in, Je in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 23, gave that to Jacob. And here Esau, Isaac, I'm sorry, is purposely giving that to who he thinks is Esau. If it was Esau, he would have been going in direct, the, um, what's the word I want? The direct, he would have been opposition of what God had said. He would have really, I don't know if God would have taken his voice from him and wouldn't have let him say it. I don't know what God would have done, but God would have stopped this short because God had already ordained this was to be Jacob's. But God didn't stop it because he really is blessing Jacob with the blessing he's supposed to. He's really giving him that right blessing. He just thinks he's giving it to his other son. And we're going to see later when he sends Jacob out, he does bless him the right way, the way that, that he should have. He finishes it off with a spiritual blessing now. We've got national blessing. We've got the blessing of power and ru rulership. I can't get that word out. And now spiritual blessing. Cursed be those who curse you. Blessed be those who bless you. Remember Genesis 12, 3? Right out of the Abrahamic covenant. And that in that Abrahamic covenant is the promises of the covenant all the way down to Messiah. So all of these. And all these blessings that we're reading here, Israel, the nation, will receive in the millennium. God has promised this to Israel, to be the head nation, to be fruitful, to be blessed in that way, to have all the other nations bow to Israel, to have the spiritual blessings also. If they come against Israel, if they don't even come up and bring their blessings through Israel to God, they won't get rain on their, their nations. They'll end up without crops. They'll end up with starvation. So we see all of these kingdom blessings and fulfill. Anyone who says that the Jews are in control today, hello? Where do you see the nations bowing to Israel today? Where do we see this? This is the flip side. This is the rule of, gen of Gentiles. This is Nebuchadnezzar's um, image. We do not see Jewish nation world rule. And by the way, those who say that the Jews own the banks, I, if the statement I have read recently is accurate, I have no reason to believe it's not, but I have no way on my own to prove it. 21 out of the 23 strongest banks, you know, in those orders, are all Gentile owned and rolled. We've only got a few little Jews down here, so there goes all those theories and everything that that is wrong. But the point here is. Isaac is going to it has just now blessed Jacob as the spiritual head of the family. Isaac had that right. The blessing was given to him, not to Ishmael. Remember, Ishmael was not given that. And he can pass that blessing that's connected to the covenant with Abraham on to his son. So he had the right to pass it down to Jacob or Esau. In normal, it would have been Esau born first, but God told him, no, you give that to Jacob. So he's doing what he had his right to do. It was his right to give it, but God seeing to it, in spite of their actions, that is passing down to the very right descendant, to Jacob. Now here's where I want to bring out a spiritual lesson for us that really is beautiful might give us a different take for a moment on this picture. Jacob is accepted by his father when he comes in the name and the garment of his elder brother. Okay? Jacob's accepted by Isaac when he's wearing Esau's clothes and saying he's Esau. We're accepted by our father in heaven when we come in the name of our elder brother. Who is our elder brother? Jesus. Yeshua, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2, and I am going to end on this. I know we're running out of time, and we'll pick up the story. That I don't think I'm leaving you on a cliffhanger because you all know the story. Hebrews 2, verses 11 and 12 says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Okay, we all come from God the Father, so 
Yeshua Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brethren in the flesh, saying, I will proclaim your name, God's name, to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Yeshua sang praise to God the Father when he was here on earth in his human form. And again, verse 13, I will, Yeshua speaking, I will put my trust in him, in God. We know that, that he was equal to God, but he set aside his equality, taking on that human form, locking himself into human flesh, and in that human flesh, he is our brother. And that's why he says, again, behold, I am the children whom God has given, has given me. Okay? So he's saying, I will call brethren the ones that the Father's given me who are going to have faith in the Father through me. In that way, he is our brother. We don't take him down off of the level of God at the same time, so we respect him. It's not a sibling that's equal to us. I don't want to say that. But we talked earlier about how we're clothed in his robe of righteousness. We put on his robe of righteousness. Jacob put on Esau's garments. We come in the name of Jesus to the Father. When we come in the name of our elder brother and in his garments, we are accepted by the Father. Um, I, I'm going to give you some verses to back that up. If you can hold up before you have to run, give me one minute to finish this so you get the whole thought. Go with me real quickly to Colossians 3.17. It's in your cross-references. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. They're together. Okay, we get in the name of Jesus giving glory to the Father, giving thanks to the Father. John 16, 24. John 16 and verse 24. John 16, 24. We read, Until now you've asked nothing in my name. You showed Jesus speaking. Ask and you will receive so your joy will be made full. We ask in Jesus' name. And then Acts 4 and verse 12 for my final proof, because I like to give you two or three uh, witnesses. Acts 4 and verse 12, we read, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men that by which we must be saved. So in the name of Jesus, we come for our salvation. In the name of Jesus, we can ask of the Father and receive. In the name of Jesus, we can bring glory to the Father. The same way that we're seeing in this spiritual picture. We come in our brother's garments, his robe of righteousness. We come asking in our brother's name. We don't even come asking in our own name. Oh, I'm saved now, so I'm good enough now. In, in Rochelle's name, amen. Oh, curse those words <laughs> but in the name of Jesus now the father was pleased by the son's offering okay we know that because we know that when Yeshua offered himself on the cross it satisfied the father the garment gave a sweet smell to the father when when Yeshua sacrificed his life the smell of the sacrifice of the lamb was sweet in the Father's nostrils. It's speaking of Yeshua's righteousness or his righteous life. And when we are in our righteousness that's his, then we bring him a sweet smelling savor. Even when where prayers are asking and praising, we are a sweet smelling savor, especially in our praises. And we become joint heirs with him. Yeshua is the one who it all comes to. It's all his. He is the heir of all things. He created all things and they all come to him. But we are brought in as joint heirs. Because when we're brethren, when you have the father of an estate pass away, not that our father passes away, he doesn't, but we know when they inherit the estate, all the siblings, unless things have been de designated differently, receive. If there's nothing that, that said, they'll receive equally. We know the older son, in our case here, gets the bigger birthright blessing, but still, they all receive. They all. 
I would say Yeshua gets that double. He's, he's the head. He's the older brother. But we all receive because we become joint heirs. So even though we have a picture that in our flesh we are seeing as deception, at the same time we're seeing a beautiful spiritual lesson. Come before the Lord, come before God the Father, dressed in our robe of righteousness, in his name, and receive blessing far beyond what Jacob's going to receive from his earthly father. Isn't that a beautiful picture? To, to see that and to know that it was sweet smelling unto the Lord. Okay? So keep that in mind as we go back and we see, and I'll say in my mind right now, even that shows me how even out of our oops, God can turn around and bring blessing and bring good. Even out of our mistakes or out of something someone did wrong around us, God can still bring it out. So I think that is a good place to stop. I just realized we're at 29. We'll pick it up in 30 next time. We'll find out. Jacob's just barely going to go out. Here comes Esau. Uh-oh. The deception is going to be revealed. But it's a good note to end on um, to see a spiritual picture in the midst of this. So um, good food for thought. We'll continue talking. We'll see. Isaac's going to realize his mistake. Notice how he responds. I'll tell you from the Hebrew how he responds. But he definitely realizes, wow. I almost blew it. I'll give you that much. I'll tell you the rest next week when you come back. Um, but we've got we've got a little more to go to get through our story. I think it's a good place where we can stop, though. Are there questions, comments? I know the wheels are turning. Yes, Rowena. Okay. Uh, when you were talk when you were talking about um, the lies, like the the Egyptian midwives lied, and then Rahab lied, and now Rebecca lied even more. I mean, probably the intentions of their heart were good. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. It just shows how the other verse says that our um, our good works are like filthy rights. I thought that right when you started. Very good point. Yes, Isaiah 64, 6, even our righteousness. Our right acts are like filthy rags. We don't realize how holy our God is and how unholy we are. But I think it's why God didn't go after Rebecca and Jacob in a harsh way because he saw the intents of their heart. They were wanting to do what was right. Jacob wanted the spiritual blessing that God had said would be his. Rebecca wanted the right son to get it according to what God said. And she, like I said, she might have even been thinking, I'll spare my husband getting the wrath of God on him because he's about to make a foolish mistake. I'll keep him from that foolish mistake. It still doesn't make it right what they did. They still should have gone to the Lord and let the Lord work it out. But yeah, I think that the Lord saw the intents of their heart. I really do. You know, so many of us want to help the Lord out and in our flesh we'll reach out to do that and we'll find a way to justify it. We'll find a way to think we're doing right. Yes, Maria, can you unmute her? We're trying. You know, when, when when you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of things that the Bible doesn't tell us about the uh, about the uh, characters or the authors of certain books, like we're studying right now. Um, but uh, that's why I do believe that it, it uh -oh. answers. Back up. You do believe what? You froze, Maria. Oh, okay, but in heaven, I said, we will have that, that like that, the uh, uh, the teaching or, or the the class of the uh, questions and answers. Right, right, <laughs> right. I, I imagine <laughs> going up to this. We will have, we will have, we have trainings in heaven. We will have conferences in heaven. Right, <laughs> and chances to go up to these people and ask them. Were we right what we were thinking? You know, how were you feeling? What were you thinking? Yeah, there's a lot of times when I think I just want to sit down with our Bible people and just ask them a little bit more, you know, because they're the only ones that can really tell yeah. us what they were thinking and feeling and, and so forth and so on. But, yeah. But God, wow. Yeah, and, and, and also, uh, 
you know, when you say, uh, you know, they don't, they don't mention the ladies or the women's uh, Agents. age. Agents, Agents, I laugh at that. that. that that way said it is wrong, never ask a woman her age. <laughs> I laugh at that because it is funny how Sarah seems to be the only exception. And you have <laughs> bless you. I think that God allowed enough time for all that to happen. Yeah. Because it was all happening. Yes, he didn't yeah, stop I mean, it from happening. He right. could have. He could have intervened. But he did allow it to be carried Esau out. Esau didn't come in halfway through the Right. Right. Whatever. Right, yeah, and Isaac didn't catch on and say, "You are Jacob." You know, you're yeah. you're deceiving me. You know, yeah, yeah. He did allow it. He did allow it. Yeah, yeah, and he did allow Rahab to lie and hide the spies. They weren't caught. He did allow Moses to live. He wasn't put to death. You know, so God does allow. It almost makes me think also, though, is God has a best way for us. And that's what he wants for us. And sometimes we get in the way and we don't allow that best way. And so he allows something secondary. So again, I really, right now, I am curious. Lord, how would you have handled it? Let's unwind to that point. Isaac's just told Esau, go out and get the food. What would you have done, God? What would have happened here? I'm curious. Throwing chest hair and arm hair. <laughs> no, because that's deceit. Yeah. He says maybe Jacob would have on the spot grown the hair. <laughs> but that's still deceit. He yeah. was still the wrong son. Would God have spoken out of heaven the same way he stopped Abraham from offering up Isaac? It was the voice out of heaven. Would God have let it get to the, that point, let Esau bring in the food, let Isaac come right up to that moment, open his eyes, yeah. and then, yeah, open his eye. well, except he was intent on, on giving it to Esau. So opening his eyes wouldn't have done it, because he would have thought, that's the son I want to bless. But would God have spoken out of heaven and pulled him up short and said, you know, thou shalt not, you know, yeah. don't know, don't know. You know, um, he let Sarah go into the harem, but he didn't let the king touch her. You know, he mm. protected her. Yeah. So he would have protected his line. Rowena, pop in. Um, and also when um, Rebecca said, um, don't worry, if he curse you, the curse will be on me. We really could not do that because each one is responsible for their own decision. Right. So even in this case, both uh, Rebecca and uh, Jacob suffered the separation and, right. and the pain of not seeing each other anymore. Right, right. It, our actions have consequences. You know, they just do. But, uh, but, you know, we don't get away with something. We don't get to pull a fast one. But we do see God's grace. We do see that the line was kept. The blessing went to the right one. And it goes all the way down to Messiah. There's never compromise in that line. Never. You know, remember if Sarah, when she was in the harem, if the king had had, or the pharaoh, whatever you want to call him, if he had had relations with Sarah, even though she was past the age of childbearing, still it would have cast a shadow on whose daddy is Isaac. And they didn't have DNA testing to run do DNA testing and prove the parenthood in that day. God didn't even let that come up for chance. There's not one person that can put doubt on that and say, well, we're not sure who Isaac's daddy is. You don't know. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows. Isaac's daddy was Abraham. God gave him back the fruit of his, of his loins and, or, you know, reinvigorated him and opened up the womb of Sarah. So um, God's just amazing, you know. And like I say, I'm curious. How would you have handled it, God? What would you have done? Yeah, what would have been your perfect plan? And the, the, for us to learn out of this, let's not take things in our own hands. Let's trust and see so that we can see God's hand at work. We love to see God's hand at work. We love the miracle stories. We love the testimonies. We love, you know, the mess turned into a message, the test into a testimony. We would thrill to have another story to share. And in our own lives, there's opportunity for that when we put everything into God's hands, even when it's so 
you know, it's, it's, it's at that moment and it's scary and it's like it's all going to be lost if we don't do something. It's hard to not jump in there and rescue. It really is. But learn our lesson. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are loving toward your humanity and that you do not expect perfection out of us that you do give us the ability to do right by your power and your strength. May we yield to you, Lord, not thinking we're doing you a favor or anything else. Let us not take it into our own hands. Let us learn from these others and let us allow you the time and the space to work it and move it perfectly according to your perfect will because your will will be done and your plan will not be thwarted so we can trust and not fear. But Lord, enable us. Fill us with your spirit. May we feed the spiritual and not the flesh so we can be strong in you. And thank you that you go with us and you, uh, even though we don't want to take it, you are forgiving. You, are, you won't throw us out when we don't live perfectly. But may we live as close to that as possible. Glory to you. More in the image of our beloved elder Son who is deity with you, Yeshua Jesus. And we give it all to you in your precious name. Amen.